Hello to everyone. Uh, welcome in this uh, uh, webinar series of ICN2 in collaboration with Nanomedicine Lab in Manchester University. Uh, it's a pleasure to have this uh, webinars, uh, webinar today with uh, a great uh, speaker, uh, a professor, well-known professor, uh, Professor Anja uh, Boysen from Technical University of uh, Denmark. Uh, an expert in nanosensors, microfluidics, microfabricated devices, and applications in drug delivery and more. Anja is a head of uh, the section and professor at Department of Health Technology at Technical University of Denmark. Uh, she's heading also uh, uh, DNRF uh, and Billium Center of Excellence named uh, IDUN, Intelligent Drug Delivery and Sensing using microcontainers and nano machine mechanics. Uh, uh, her research group uh, is working in the development and application of micro and nano mechanical sensors and mi microfabricated systems with interest for oral drug delivery. Uh, she is a co-founder of companies Cantion, uh, Silmeco, Blue Sense Diagnostics, and Light Novo. Uh, Professor uh, Boysen is, uh, among others, member of the board of the Leo Foundation, the board of Ilium Foundation, the Danish Academy of the Technical Sciences, and the Royal Danish Academy of Sciences. In 2008, she was awarded the largest research prize in Denmark, the William Kahn uh, Rasmussen Award in uh, 2012. And she was awarded also an Elite Force Award from the Danish Ministry of Research, Innovation and Higher Education. In 2013, uh, Anja received the, the Sapere Aude uh, Top Researcher Award from the Danish Council for Independent Research. And recently, in 2020, she was awarded the Order of uh, Dannebrog by Her Majesty the Queen of Denmark. So it's really a great pleasure to have uh, uh, Anja today for this uh, talk. But before starting with her talk, as usually, we will have a very short introdu introductory talk by a, a young researcher, in this case, a PhD student, uh, Enrica Lucio, who is going to give a very short introductory talk. In fact, not directly related to this, but somehow related because Enric is going to speak about nanosensors, nanobiosensors for point of care, which is very important before one should take decision to do uh, therapy and drug delivery and so on. So uh, Enric, uh, the floor now in, is yours. I want to remind all the assistants that uh, whatever question you may have, please write uh, in the chat. Uh, and at the end of the, the, the talk by, by Professor uh, Boysen, I will uh, read the questions uh, uh, for uh, the, the, the speaker. Uh, thank you very much. So please mute microphones if, if, if not done. So the, the floor is yours, Anja. Thank you very much. Thank you, Arvin, and the people organizing this in ICN2 for giving me the chance to give this brief and broad uh, introduction on biosensors, specifically point of care biosensors, and their relevance in, in diagnostics nowadays, especially with the COVID situation, but not only this. So the way to, one of the ways to understand point of care biosensors uh, would be to compare them with more classical diagnostic techniques, because these ones, although they are very sensitive, they provide a lot of information with every analysis, they have some drawbacks, like high cost, because this equipment is uh, expensive. It takes time to do the, an the analysis. Uh, the equipment is also huge sometimes, or it's tabletop and it's difficult to move around. And also importantly, it takes uh, trained users to be able to work with them. And in comparison point of care by sensors, the, the main aim is to be able to do what classical diagnostics do, but in the point of interest and performed by the personal, by, by the people who really need the result. So there is this feedback, uh, thanks to progress with biotechnology and nanotechnology, which makes it possible to integrate this into small devices, the biosensors, which are able to be used by people. So there is a way to describe the, the criteria that there are so in order to describe by sensors and point of care by sensors and it was published by the world health organization which is in this reassured criteria which is an acronym 
that means real-time connectivity, ease of specimen collection, affordable in terms of money, sensitive and specific and for obvious reasons to have uh, good results, user-friendly so that anyone can, is able to use it, rapid and robust because you need the result right here, right now, and in any condition like temperature or humidity, equipment free and deliverable, meaning that uh, it's a small device that can be easily transported. And here in Professor Mercoci's Nanobioelectronics and Biosensor Group, we are dedicated, among other things, to work in the development of point of care biosensors. Uh, one of the mm, key points in point of care is what materials we work with. And in here, paper is one main, the main actor, we could say. Why? Because it's uh, compatible with many of the criteria I defined in the previous slide, because it's a material that is uh, cheap and it's abundant. It's easy to man manufacture and manipulate. It can be recycled. And due to its porosity, it's compatible with microfluidics. And you can also store bioreagents there, like antibodies or DNA. It, paper is also compatible with nanomaterials such as graphene or other 2D related materials and with nanoparticles and quantum dots for both colorimetric and uh, or fluorescent assays, which makes paper compatible with lateral flow technologies, electrochemistry, printed technologies, microfluidics. And in here you can see just an overview of the work that we do in our group. Also. Uh, related to point of care, paper is very compatible to use with smartphone based detection so that you can, like being a small computer as it is and a smartphone nowadays and being available for almost everybody, uh, you can analyze, you can take a picture, for instance, of your color metric assay, automatically analyze it and see the result. Or maybe you're able, thanks to internet, to send it to a, some health specialist to give you feedback. And related to paper, uh, lateral flow assays are the paradigm of the of paper-based point of care biosensors. sensors. As you probably know by now, due to the COVID situation and the ubiquity of uh, of rapid antigen tests, uh, lateral flow assays are like paper-based, uh, different paths stored sequentially, in which they have uh, pre-stored uh, bioreceptors in them. So when you add a sample on, on the bottom end. There is this, it's like a, a small laboratory and a small trip, and a small strip, and the sample is detected by the antibodies in the conjugate pad, and with, which is conjugated to gold nanoparticles or other kind of uh, nanomaterials. And they flow and they are at the same time detected in pre-stored antibodies uh, in, the, in the middle pad, in the nitrocellulose, so that depending on the, on the presence or not of your target analyte, you will observe uh, uh, the appearance of one line or two lines, depending on if you are negative or positive. So we had established a protocol, which was published uh, one year and a half ago, more or less. And we wanted to apply this when the outbreak of coronavirus uh, took place. And we basically started from having this pool of antibodies that we but because they were they were brand new and we could uh, successfully implement our protocol in order to develop a lateral flow test for uh, for the detection of the nucleoprotein of SARS-CoV-2 with a rather good limit of detection of three nanograms per minute. So, but as you know, with the appearance of new strains of the virus, and, but not only virus depends; it could be cancer biomarkers or environmental pollutants. We always need to go deeper to have lower limits of detection. Of course, it depends on the situation. You may not always need a like, single molecule detection. That's why ultra sensitive detection is necessary. And also not leaving the coronavirus uh, case, people in our group develop this more classical electrode setup uh, in which there was a bound an aptomer that had in one of its ends a redox reporter. And therefore, when the spike protein of the coronavirus was present, the aptamer changed its conformation and the proximity of the redox reporter to the electrode was changing, thus also changing the charge transfer and the current from before and after having the target analyte. And with this, uh, 
uh, we aim to reach uh, uh, working ranges in between nanomolar and, and picomolar. In my particular case, I work in implementing 2D materials such as graphene in paper uh, based sensors to make so that they are point of care uh, using this technique that was developed here in the group in which we filter graphene oxide and we reduce it with a laser in this in the pattern that we wish we design it and therefore this reduced graphene oxide is highly detachable and just by pressing stamping only the design of reduced graphene oxide uh, is transferred to any substrate including paper and particularly i'm developing an electrochemical lateral flow using this uh, reduced graphene oxide electrodes on nitrocellulose using different kind of nanoparticles that can catalyze um, electrochemical reactions and we here we can see these uh, nanoparticles in the nitrocellulose uh, working in below the working electrode so that we can detect them and this was my broad introduction to point of care via sensors and how they are useful for pandemic situations but also day-to-day -day health uh, issues and I'm for us environmental situations and I also wanted to stress the importance of paper in the development of point of care by sensors and, and materials in order to improve the sensitivity. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, thank you very much uh, Enric for the nice introduction and now uh, we'll have uh, the talk uh, uh, by Professor Anja Boysen about uh, uh, micro nano engineering and drug delivery. So please, Anja, you can, may share the screen. Thank you very much. The floor is yours. So thank you very much, Arben, for the uh, invitation and for the introduction. And I can see in the chat that it's not only from your group in Barcelona and UK, there's people from far, far away, which I think is very nice. And also uh, very nice with this. Uh, short talk, Enrique. It's really nice work uh, I can see you're doing. Uh, so today I'll tell you a bit about what we do in uh, our center that we call EDUN. And here you can see that uh, we really uh, believe in uh, doing better science, at least this is what we try to do, and to also grow better scientists and to also create new businesses. And I have some examples of how we try to translate. And below you can see that we believe in openness, inclusiveness, having ambitions, making a difference, and collaboration. So we were started around six years ago to become a center, and it happened kind of by coincidence. I had applied for two grants, and it was really so lucky that we got both of them. One from the Danish National Research Foundation to try to do something completely new to us at least, to use microfabrication tools to do devices for drug delivery. And the other one from the Prairie Foundation was to continue our work within nanosensors. Um, and I was actually called to the office of the director of the Danish National Research Foundation um, because he told me, Anya, what are you doing? You can't run these two activities. You have promised your time 80% in both of them. Uh, and I was really, really afraid that he would ask me to choose which one <laughs> to go with. But then he suggested, why don't you combine them? Because then you're only administering one, th one thing. So it actually started being a really arranged marriage, but it has turned into be a really, really happy marriage because there's a lot of cross fertilization. A lot of our sensors can be applied within uh, either diagnostics or uh, analyzing new drugs. And I have a few examples on that. So this is kind of what defined uh, our new goal which is very much focused on uh, health technology. So if you look at our kind of our vision, uh, then it is to implement top-down micro and nanotechnology discoveries to life science challenges. And we also really strive towards translating our activities into practical applications and also spin-outs, because then you can really feel that you're making a difference. So this is us when we are gathered, uh, we were so happy in May to be allowed to go outside, offsite, and, and meet. So this is north of Copenhagen in a city called Helsingør. Uh, maybe you can see we're really multicultural, uh, also very different scientific backgrounds, all the way from computer science to uh, pharmacy, for example. Uh, and it's a collaboration between also University of Copenhagen and what's called SSI. This is where we do the vaccine development uh, in Denmark. And if you're interested, you can follow us on Twitter and Facebook and LinkedIn. 
So we have uh, a range of group seniors uh, that I'll also acknowledge uh, as I go uh, ahead in my talk. And these are really important people to actually uh, help coordinating the work and supervise our students. If you look at our foundation, so when I was uh, starting my own research, I worked in what's called nanomechanical sensors. We still do a bit of that. Then we work with centrifugal microfluidics. Uh, I have an example for you on that. And then uh, we have Edwin, he really loves to uh, hack everything. So he takes stuff apart and assembles them again in new ways. For example, repurposing a blue wave layer. We also have Oleksi, he really likes to build big instruments, optical instruments for our own Raman-based uh, analysis. And then we do a range of fabrication inside and outside our clean room uh, facilities here, just next door to, to where I am right now. So uh, to illustrate a bit of what we do, and also to illustrate this combination of sensors and, and drug delivery activities, I've chosen four stories that I think communicate well. So the first one is on stability analysis of drugs. Then it's on uh, diagnostics. You just saw an example of that. And then it's on uh, cell culturing, and then it's on our activities within drug delivery. And then uh, the first one here uh, is that uh, when we started this collaboration with the uh, University of Copenhagen and Department of Pharmacy, we realized how it important it is to characterize new drug formulation at a very early stage, often also when you have very little amount of material available. And some of these formulations, they're not stable in when the humidity is changing or if temperature is changing. So they really are in need of tools that can help them analyzing this. So here we actually use some of my old research tools. So these are nanomechanical sensors. Here you see a string in silicon nitride um, and it's a little tiny resonator. So it resonates just like a guitar string. It has a well-defined resonance frequency. And if you change the mass, if you imagine you put a piece of chewing gum on it, the mass would change and then it will detune, it will resonate at a slightly different resonance frequency. And it's also really sensitive to temperature changes, just like a guitar, uh, if you took it to a different room with a different temperature, the guitar string would detune simply because of different thermal expansion of your string and the uh, support structure it's sitting on. So that's what we are using to build, for example, ultra sensitive temperature measurements. And uh, our collaborator from the University of Copenhagen here, it's Kalle. He has a background in uh, pharmaceutical sciences and he had a range of new materials that he wanted to analyze. And he saw some of our devices and he got just super excited because what he can do is just drizzle down on these resonators, tiny amount of uh, powder drop, for example, put it into a little environmental chamber and then measure resonance frequency change as a function of temperature change. And by doing so, because that's an indirect measure of, of temperature changes on the string and in the material, he can actually detect minute changes uh, in phases. So he can actually see below the glass transition uh, what's actually happening within the material. And for some of these materials, this hadn't been done before and certainly not in only picogram of materials. Then um, Peter O'Kev here, he came along also with a pharmaceutical science background. And he's really, really interested in monitoring how water is getting in and out of drug crystals, which is also related to how stable a drug in in its final formulation. And he really struggled in the beginning to how can he put his little crystals on top of a resonator until in the end, he and another Peter in, in our group, they got this really smart idea. Why not just use the drug crystal itself as a tiny resonator. And that's what you see uh, in the left here. Uh, that's a drug crystal mounted such that it can resonate just like a tiny cantilever. And then you do the uh, measurements as before, mounted in an environmental uh, chamber and monitor how the resonance frequency is changing over time. And by doing so, Peter was actually able to follow uh, the hydration and dehydration patterns inside these crystals, which is new information at the single crystal level. My final uh, example in terms of characterization of drugs is this one where Oleksi and Roman, they have built some of our new nice Raman uh, systems and Chiara used it then for analyzing some of our drug containers. So here on the left, you can actually see that we are now able chemically to map 
inside a 300 micron container, where do we have drug, which is the red part, and where do we have a filling polymer, which is the green part. And then on top of that, uh, Oleksi got this uh, nice idea that if you then use polarized light uh, to illuminate a surface, you can actually see not only the chemistry you normally see in Raman uh, imaging, but you can also see crystal orientation or orientation of whatever you have on your surface. So this to the left of here is what you would normally see on the top of a tablet uh, by Raman imaging. You would see where do I have my drop, which is red. Where do I have a filling polymer, which would be green here, and some fluorescence background. And then if you use this polarized uh, light setup that uh, we've built, you'll actually be able to see within the red region, the orientation uh, of individual uh, smaller domains. So this is something you would normally need to go um, to kind of an X-ray facility or circuiton facility to be able to do. And now you can do it uh, with your home built Raman system. So that's something that has been now translated into a company called Lightno, where Olexi is, is building these systems and, and selling them. So that was my first story out of the fall. My second story relates to uh, diagnostics uh, using uh, just a single drop of blood uh, and focusing just on, on detecting one thing at a time. So we have an example here also related, just like you heard before, to the current situation. Uh, where there is now a need not only for detecting whether we have had the virus or not, uh, but also if we have the antibodies uh, and also the level of antibodies in our blood. And there is really also a need for a lot of these uh, sensors at a low cost. So our approach to this uh, was actually to uh, kind of repurpose a Blu-ray player um, because inside a Blu-ray player, you have really fine mechanics that you can use to rotate a disc. And it also comes with really unique optics. It has actually three different lasers inside, normally a Blu-ray player, and it has a spot size uh, of less than a micron. So here you can see what we did more than six years ago in our lab when we started this. We make these discs with engraved channels. We put one drop of blood in the center and we start spinning. So you can do the centrifugation of the blood sample. So then you can actually transfer a part of your uh, centrifuge um, blood plasma over here in a compartment where you have preloaded magnetic beads, nano beads that you use for an agglutination assay. And then you read out the agglutination assay with a blue laser in the back. And the blue laser comes from the uh, Blu-ray player uh, that we have hacked. And normally, depending on what type of coding you have in your beads, it will take you between five to 10 minutes to get the readout. So this is when it was researched in our lab. Now it's a company called Lucent Diagnostics, and it was founded by, you can see Robert here, a former postdoc, Filippo, former PhD, and Marco, a former postdoc. Uh, the company is called Lucent Diagnostics. It's based in Copenhagen, and it also has an affiliation in Taiwan uh, where they actually build this blue box. And it makes sense because it's in Taiwan where you have all the manufacturers uh, of, uh, you know, you can say these pickup heads or uh, Blu-ray players and, and uh, playstations and so forth. So um, actually uh, here, um, uh, Blue Cell Diagnostics, they have been working a lot with Zika and dengue fever, uh, but now also because of the situation, they have a product on the market for detection of antibodies and also the concentration uh, of antibodies in your blood sample. And it's available in Italy in the pharmacies and also in, in Denmark. So we thought, okay, we have tried once to, uh, to spin out a company in, uh, in diagnostics. Maybe we can try something with a different technology that we have in our group and maybe go for something not really diagnostics, but more uh, therapeutic drug monitoring. So we are trying to target, um, you know, when you are treating patients and you would like to monitor what's the concentration of drug in the patient's bloods. And that's very crucial, for example, in the, the treatment of cancer. So uh, in such a treatment, we would like to, to help the medical doctors to make sure that when they dose the drug, that the patient is always within the therapeutic window so that we are not dosing too much or too little so we kind of have no effect. And our first uh, test molecules in this case is uh, a drug that's used uh, for the treatment of children with leukemia and is normally used in very high doses. It also means that if you should treat 
in this way, which is really, really efficient. So the survival rate here in Copenhagen for this is very, very high. Uh, but you need to have a lab next door that can do the therapeutic drug monitoring because um, the children will metab metabolize this drug very differently and you need to be sure that you are in the right concentration range. Otherwise, you need to administer an antidote. And here we collaborate with um, the head of the patriarchal ca uh, cancer unit in uh, Copenhagen, Kashmirklov. And then the rest of the team here is our local people working on this project, which is funded by something called the Bioinnovation Institute, uh, funded by the Nobel Foundation. So they have given us a grant over three years to do research that then after three years should be translated into the a company. So that's the first time we try something like this. It's an usual way to, to do science, but it's, it's really, really motivating and interesting. And we really want to, to achieve this uh, company startup. The way we do the detection of this small molecule drug, MTX, is surface enhanced Raman scattering. So this is a technology we have been working on for the past 10 years. And it requires that the molecules you want to detect, they sit on a rough metallic surface, because then it's known that the Raman the signal is going to be enhanced up to like a billion times. So you shine laser light down with one wavelength, and then some of the light is inelastically scattered in your molecule, and it comes back with a slightly different wavelength. And it's this shift uh, in wavelength that we use to do a chemical fingerprint of whatever we have on our surface. So in order to make a rough metallic surface, uh, we made nanoglass. So it's etching into silicon without any mask or anything. It's also called black silicon. And it's a technique that was initially developed by Michael and then further developed by Caillou and Thomas, as you can see here. You can coat with gold or silver uh, as you please. And in the end, it looks more or less uh, like this. And you can tune the height and the density of the pillars. And it works really uh, as a very good enhancement. Enhancer. You we normally do it on a four or six uh, inch wafer and then cut the wafer into small pieces and store them until we need to do the measurements. And it's also an example of a little company that was established some years back where people and researchers can go in and, and order their own Swiss substrates to develop their own applications. For this therapeutic drug monitoring, we use the tools that we have at hand now. So we know that we can do these rough metallized surfaces. We also know that we can use these surfaces as electrodes. So applying a potential to the surface substrate, you can actually attract molecules depending on that charge. So it's a way to kind of filter out specific molecules. And you can also repel the molecules again such that you can actually reuse your surface. We know we can integrate these types of sensors into the centrifugal microfluidic platform. And we have also shown that we can actually communicate with even ele electrodes on these chips in a wireless manner. So we kind of have the ingredients that are needed to build an instrument. Just to show you that you can do this surge sensing uh, on a disc, I've shown you this example, which is not blood in this case, it's milk spiked with the melamine. You see the milk sample is coming here and down, and only half of the surge chip is dipped into the milk sample. And that's because we discovered that this surge a chip works as a filter paper. Maybe you can see it, that you have kind of a film moving upwards and it gets darker and darker on the surface chip because it's actually drawn uh, up through the pillars, but only the small molecules can get up through the pillars. So all the big proteins and so on are stuck below. If you just dry out later and want to measure, you can see that we have a clean region up here and this contaminated region where the liquid stopped. If you do Raman imaging afterwards or search imaging, you can see a clear fingerprint of whatever molecule you're looking at up here in the dry region and nothing in the contaminated region because everything uh, has been covered by proteins or whatever in your sample. So this is a really nice way of filtering the sample even more. What we've also seen is that uh, dipping only part of a search chip into a liquid, in this case, it's a urine sample, you can kind of do uh, liquid thin film chromatography, because depending on the molecules, they're going to have different affinity to, for example, your gold coated nanopillars. So some molecules will travel further than others. So you can spatially uh, spread out your molecules so that they are much easier to distinguish from one another. So that's an additional benefit of doing it like this. So 
so where are we now in terms of uh, therapeutic drug monitoring? We have shown here that Yaman, that uh, the concept also works with blood and it works with MGX. Initially, he simply just designed this little thing where he could dip uh, our search chip's head into uh, a solution with blood and MGX. And then he could show it works just exactly like I've already shown you for, for urine and milk. Um, and we're now integrating it uh, on disk and also using uh, this EC service, electrochemical assisted service also. We have built a little instrument to do this bedside, or at least in a small portable unit. We've done a lot of calibration curves. And um, in Yaman's paper, we, we have shown the first uh, data on patient samples. We are measuring on more samples now. Uh, these are from two children at the hospital where we get a blood sample before treatment starts and after treatment has started. And we use the before sample as a way of calibrating uh, our signal. And you can see in this case, we had one patient where we were really close to uh, the concentration in the patient sample. And then the other one, we were kind of, you know, 50% off. Uh, and this really has to do with um, that we need to uh, purify the blood sample more and that patient blood samples are just behaving so much differently uh, from just uh, test blood samples uh, we can buy. But that's work in progress. So that was my second example. My third example relates to uh, a little story uh, where we actually grow uh, mammalian cells and bacteria. And actually a lot of my uh, colleagues in other research groups here that are really working a lot in in vitro systems. So it wasn't really our plan to, to move into this. It kind of happened because we have a collaboration who's really interested in bacterial biofilms. And we wanted to help him treat these bacterial biofilms. So maybe you have heard that some bacteria, they really have this fantastic ability to avoid being killed by antibiotics. And one of the things they do is that they form communities on surfaces where they aggregate or in solution. Um, and they kind of sit in this uh, chewy mucus-like biofilm where the drugs will not penetrate and kill all the bacteria. And Sun and Helle here, they have uh, a system and uh, Janus, where they have kind of made their own microfluidic system uh, where they grow bacterial biofilms inside. And uh, then Laura came and saw it because we were going to use it and it kind of didn't look uh, that simple. You can see uh, the amount of tubing, the amount of uh, growth media for the bacteria that's needed for this because there's a lot of dead volume, pumps, bubble traps, waste over here. So uh, Laura thought, okay, maybe I can do all of this on a disk um and just keep life a little simpler so this is actually what we uh, did so in here you can see uh, a reservoir of liquid uh, that will uh, maintain growth of cells or bacteria for up to a week there's a growth chamber here on the disc where you can have your bacteria growing and you can inoculate from over here and then you have a waste reservoir outside and then uh, when you need to grow bacteria you simply put your disc or several discs uh, on top of each other here on a little spindle motor, and then you spin slowly, and then you will actually provide nutrition and the fluid for uh, several days without doing anything. You don't need any pumps. You don't have any problems with uh, bubbles, and it's very easy to move into an incubator. Uh, so you don't really need to touch it. On top of that, uh, Edwin, our great hacker, has uh, mounted a little camera uh, with a lens, so it's kind of a microscope below the disc and it rotates together with the disc and it translates the signal wirelessly to outside the incubator, such that we now, for example, can do toxicity, cytotoxicity assays on mammalian cells. And then we analyze uh, our data with AI software also coming uh, as a spin out from, from here. And we were just so fortunately uh, just a few months ago to get a grant to hire uh, some people to actually uh, try to make another uh, spin out on this uh, within the three years. This will bring me to my uh, final uh, story, which is on the uh, devices for drug delivery. And um, here you can see we started actually with micrometer sized devices. They, the ones here on the finger, they're kind of the same size as uh, sugar grains and they're around 300 microns in diameter. And the motivation was actually for us, if we could somehow help 
in some cases to uh, get away from the needles uh, and provide a solution for delivering some of the drugs in the oral manner. Imagine, for example, that we could do all the vaccines we do today without having to do uh, all the injections. So why can't we really do oral delivery uh, of some of these drugs like insulin or the vaccines? Uh, two main challenges, either the, the drug is degraded as it travels through the stomach and into the intestine, or uh, it can happen both ways, but there's also some drugs that really, uh, they have a chance going into a solution and also being transported across uh, the uh, epithelium. And then they're never gonna go inside the body and into the bloodstream. And then we thought, okay, maybe we're not gonna do new formulations. That's certainly not uh, our competence. And we have a lot of companies here in Denmark doing formulations, but we are good in fabrication. So we wanted to see if we could make some small containers that can protect the drug. Uh, we are gonna put, a, for example, a pH sensitive lid on top. So it stays protected until the right location we wanna release. And then this is our dream that is gonna orient itself towards the uh, epithelium. The lid is gonna open and then all the drug is gonna come out in one direction, very close to the uh, cell uh, wall. And then we're gonna enhance the chances for the drugs to get through. That's kind of the dream scenario. There are many benefits also, also the challenges. Some of them is that uh, we really have control of size and shape when we do microfabrication, as you know. Uh, we can control when and where to release. We can put in quite a lot of drug in these containers. The drug only comes out in one direction, so we're not wasting uh, a lot of drug into the lumen. We can uh, combine drugs as we like. And we've also seen that loading uh, amorphous drugs into these containers actually stabilizes the drugs in the amorphous form much longer than if you had a big tablet. So it started with small, simple containers, and now we have ventured into a lot of different uh, applications and, uh, and also different designs. Uh, but for a start, I'm just gonna go through the very simple design just to give you the overall idea. So I started uh, initially by fabrication by my colleague, Stefan here. He simply just uh, used SU8 for the prototypes. So it's a two-step uh, photo lithography. You can just cross-link this polymer uh, with UV light and it's seen from the side. So you do two steps of cross-linking and then you just uh, remove the non-cross-link polymer and then you have a lot of these small containers uh, in this case on a silicon wafer. We can do like a 20,000 on a four inch wafer and then you can just take one of these little chips here uh, and that's normally enough 625 for one red experiment, for example. Then um, you can see here, there's around 10 nanoliters of volume in, in one of them. And you know, we started doing this and then we realized maybe a little bit late that, okay, how on earth are we gonna fill them with uh, drugs? But now we have a lot of different technologies at hand. We can uh, inject print liquids or, or we can do, in this case, it's a powder drug like Koshida's filling where she's first uh, putting PDMS everywhere uh, outside the containers and then she's kind of stamping on bussing all of the containers into a drug formulation. And then in the end, she's removing this PDMS film again. And then in this way, you only have drug uh, inside the containers and you haven't really wasted any drug. It's, it's just sitting on your partner. So this is when we have loaded powder drug into these containers, around four microgram in this case. We can then put pH sensitive bits on top. You can buy a lot of these uh, pH sensitive polymers um, because they have already been developed for coating normal regular tablets. And then you can spray coat, for example, uh, these layers on top. And then before we go into animal experiments, we uh, normally check in vitro that everything is working. So we measure by UV absorption, um, in this case, in a gastric medium, and so acidic pH, um, what, how much is coming out of the drug. In this case, nothing comes out. And then we change the pH to the intestinal medium and then we can see the drug is coming out. So this is the type of measurements we normally do uh, very initially to see if things are working. Then we need to release our containers from, from whatever carrier substrate they're on. And then we put them into small gelatin capsules that maybe you are familiar with if, if you've tried this. Uh, but of course they're smaller if we're gonna work with uh, a mouse or a rat. And here you can see 
uh, some of these small containers in a capsule for a rat experiment. So in terms of in view experiments, we normally orally dose uh, our, uh, our gelatin capsules by little instruments so that the animals are not chewing uh, on our devices. And then we take blood samples to measure if drug is actually getting across and into the bloodstream. We always work with some sort of control. It could look like this, uh, so that we fill in a drug in our small containers. And then in the control, we have the same amount of drug uh, in a big capsule without the containers and coated with the same pH sensitive layer as we use for lid for the small containers. And then we uh, work with rats in this case, and you always have to do some statistics when you work with animals. And then we do, uh, for example, blood sampling for 24 hours. And in this case, it's a drug called furosemide. So it's a small molecule drug. Um, and you can see here in this case, um, here you have plasma concentration and the blood from the animals. And here you have time. And the micro containers and the big capsules, they kind of have the same peak concentration. But then uh, the micro containers they deliver over a much longer time. And even we should have carried out the study much longer, but we simply just didn't anticipate that we would see such a prolonged release. And in this case, we have increased what's called the relative bioavailability with 220%. So we have a lot more uh, drug coming across. Looking at the animal afterwards, we could see that one of the explanations might be that these tiny containers, they really go into the mucus layer in the intestine some of them lying all the way close to, to the cell layer below. So this uh, is probably an explanation why we do see a prolonged release of this drug. So now we are targeting different applications. We currently work with delivery of probiotics, so bacteria that are good for our health, delivery of antibiotics, insulin, vaccine, and then we also have activities not in delivering, but in locally sampling uh, what content do we actually have in our intestine. We also have a few uh, challenges ahead. Um, so one thing that we're looking at now is that, of course, in the end, we're not gonna uh, deliver to a mouse or rat. We need to deliver to humans. And one of the some of the challenges we have now in smaller animals is that our devices are not staying as long as we would like, simply because you know, in a mouse, for example, everything is just out again in an hour or two because they eat all the time and everything is just pushed through. So we are also working uh, with bigger uh, animals now. So this is Medi. Um, and we're also working on trying to make devices uh, that are staying for longer. Uh, we can do different tricks with the devices to make them stay longer. And we also really need to work with biodegradable materials and FDA approved materials. So we don't want to be in a situation where the devices never get out of the body and you just pile up a, a lot of plastics in your body or even outside wouldn't be good. In terms of gripping uh, and holding on uh, to the intestine, we have tried to explore changing the overall geometry. Uh, and for this, we started 3D printing small devices. So this is Lucas who developed a way to 3D print small devices and to release them from a carrier substrate uh, afterwards, simply using a water soluble carrier substrate. And he did, uh, printed all these uh, cool looking devices. Um, this one out here, really inspired by a bacteria phage. And after doing all these devices, I know this is a busy slide and you don't need to look at all the graphs but he constructed like a little slide here where you can put on a piece of a tissue from a pig um, and you put your devices either head down or head up and you flush water through and then you increase the flow until the devices, they come off. And by doing that type of tests, you could actually see that for example, the bacteria phage and one of these with the hairy tops, uh, they worked uh, better and significantly better than some of the other designs. However, when you try to do the same uh, in vivo, so in rats, for example, you do not see the same retention. Um, so we have to do something more dramatically than this. We also, because we wanted to print smaller structures, of course, uh, Edwin and Tengen here, they uh, hacked again a Blu-ray player and built their own little uh, 3D printer where the cross-linking is now done by the pickup head from a Blu-ray player. And then they can actually print down to something like a one micron uh, lines and this way we can really uh, start printing uh, fine structures that are needed sometimes for some of our devices. We also now started bioimaging thanks to Ralph. 
uh, both in rats uh, and in pigs. So here we incorporate a contrast agent into our devices, barium sulfate it's called. And by doing so uh, in CT scan, we can actually locate the individual microcontainers. So this is where we are going now. Um, so we really want to study the same animal at different time points to see how our devices are behaving and how fast they actually travel through the system. There's so little known still on this. In terms of biodegradable materials, uh, we have moved away from SU8. Um, and this is uh, one example with Sanina working on how to actually translate the fabrication to PCL and PLGA materials instead. And then you need to move away from uh, UV exposed or normal uh, lithography and do some sort of embossing, for example, instead, because these polymers are not sensitive uh, to light and in cross-linking. In terms of how do we use these uh, devices, I have uh, two examples here. One is on antibiotics, and um, that's uh, Stine, who loaded uh, microcontainers uh, with antibiotics and coated them with a pH sensitive and also mucoadhesive adhesive coating. And she tested these uh, in vitro in some of these bacterial biofilm systems I showed you earlier on. And in her study, she could actually see by doing so, uh, she can kill three times more bacteria than just doing the normal traditional bolus dose or uh, continuous flow of the same uh, amount of antibiotics as, as we were using. So it seems to, to really work very well, also because it embeds into the biofilm. The other example of an application is delivery of insulin. And of course, we need to try it because we have a huge producer here in Denmark, Novo Nordisk, of insulin. But it's certainly not an easy molecule to work with. Insulin is known not to want to go through uh, the cell layer. It can't go through by itself. Um, so we have been working with what's called a permeation enhancer. It's a molecule that will go in and open the tight junctions between the cells such that the insulin will be able to go through and into the bloodstream. And then we thought, okay, now we have these tiny microcontainers. They will be used at least to co-locate the permeation enhancer and the insulin. So they're not working on the entire uh, intestine, but only in a small spot. And that will improve the treatment. And um, then uh, Jakob here, he tested uh, on uh, these containers uh, loaded with uh, insulin and permeation enhancer, what's actually happening, uh, not in an animal in the beginning, but just on a cell culture. And he could see if we just put in uh, this, the containers on top of the cell culture and then an in-solution permeation enhancer insulin, nothing would go through. It tells us that the containers themselves are not damaging the cell layer. If he puts in a combination of permeation enhancer and insulin, he can see that just below 20% of insulin is being transported through. And if he put half of a chip with uh, containers with insulin and the other half with permeation enhancer, something is getting through, but not as much, showing us that the co-location in one container is very important. Then you can play around with the separation. So how far away from your cell layer can you go and still get insulin across? And unfortunately, it shows that moving just one millimeter away or less, I mean, maybe half a millimeter away, you're not really getting any insulin across. And this tells us that if this should work, we need to be super close to the intestinal wall. We tried, thanks to Yarrow, twice in animals to dose insulin into containers and give them to rats. And we couldn't see anything in the blood samples afterwards. So then we had to kind of rethink what we're doing in the case of insulin. And this is what Medi and Carmen and Les are currently working on. So these we call self-unfolding foils. So it's a foil. Uh, now the prototype is made in PDMS. It has a lot of container-like structures on its surface. And when it gets out of its gelatin capsule, it's gonna try to unfold again as much as it can. It's to its original shape. And by so doing so, you can actually see it's pressing completely against uh, the wall here of a piece of uh, um, rat intestine. So we can get as close as we want, we think. And it also opens up within a few minutes. Uh, you can just see uh, the recording here of one of these gelatin capsules that are being dissolved and the foil unfolds. So we have done the first uh, experiments uh, in, in uh, rats. 
it came out uh, last year. Uh, and uh, we could actually now for the first time see that we can actually de deliver uh, insulin and measure it afterwards in the bloodstream. It's still with the bioavailability of them less than 1%, but we can measure it now for the first time. So this is kind of in the direction we are moving now, improving uh, certain things. Here at the end, I want to say that we are also now going into gut sample because there's a lot of interest in our gut uh, microbiota. And it's really hard to sample from, especially the upper part of the intestine because you can't get in there with an endoscope. Um, so here we have been really fortunate that Savage uh, and Fatima joined us. Uh, Savage comes with a background in micromotors and Fatima in cell culture and tissue engineering. Um, and here they have a device that has been preloaded uh, with uh, um, uh, precursors for hydrogel. So it's gonna, as it gets in contact with liquid, it's gonna polymerize and it's gonna grow a longer and longer tail of hydrogel. And as it grows its tail, it's gonna entrap whatever it needs on its way. So if you make it swim in a cell culture, it's gonna entrap cells um, that you can then afterwards uh, take out and analyze. And this is then exactly what uh, Savesh and Lou and Lina did here. They dosed one of these devices uh, with this uh, polymer inside to a rat. Uh, and then afterwards collected it again when it was put out. Uh, and then they could actually analyze the type of bacteria that was caught in there and compare it to the bacteria when you open the animal afterwards and look inside. And they could see that was a really good correlation. So this is uh, super exciting, we think, and something we're continuing to work on. Now it's uh, at the end, I would like to thank uh, our sponsors who have made all of this uh, work possible. And of course, thanks to all of you for, for listening and staying here. Uh, I would like, maybe some of you would be interested in joining our PhD summer school in August this year. We've just opened for the signing up and you're very welcome to work either with us on sensors, on drug delivery. It's a lot of hands-on work and a lot of uh, interesting speakers. And then just in the end, I would really like to thank all of these all awesome people who actually did a lot of the work uh, I showed you here today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anja, for this uh, very, very interesting talk. Uh, great uh, work, uh, uh, materials and technology you are using and the applications in uh, drug delivery sensors and more. So we have now time for questions. I, I will start reading uh, some of the questions here. In fact, uh, uh, one question is from Amin Amra, who is asking about the second example where part of the silicon pillar wafer is dipped in the sample. How specific is the detection of certain molecules in a complex sample? Um, I mean, it's a really good question because if you have a very complex sample, you might have um, a risk uh, that you cannot distinguish the individual peaks. So what we try to do is that we, um, we um, purify the sample as much as we can. So for example, the centrifugation and then uh, using the pillars uh, as an additional filtering effect. Um, so we haven't had any issues so far. Uh, we can detect MTX uh, in patient samples and these patients are being treated with something like 20 different uh, drugs. And they are also, sometimes they have the antidote for MTX in the blood as well. And there's no overlap. Um, so, in this case, it works. Good, uh, fantastic. So, another question from the same uh, uh, assistant. Uh, could you please repeat what is the benefit of having disc culture plates over regular flow cells for bacterial culture? So, uh, people are culturing in perfusion. So, the disc is um, just a really simple setup because you do not need any pumps. Uh, you, um, you simply just need the disc. I mean, it, this is not, I don't know if you can see it, but um, it looks maybe like this. So, uh, and it's made in plastic uh, and then you use it. And, and of course you need a little motor to spin, but it, it's a simple design. I would say that's one of the benefits. And compared to uh, normal pumps, like peristaltic pumps, here with the centrifugal microfluidics, you do not have issues with bubbles. So that's another benefit. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, uh, I, I also wrote questions here, so I am reading now my questions. <laughs> so, uh, as I said, so very, very interesting talk. Uh, I have just curiosity here about the micro containers uh, fabrication technology. 
how this is uh, compatible with mass industrial production of drugs. So, uh, because looking to the wafers and all these uh, micro containers will be there and then you will release these back. Uh, mm. right. Yes, so uh, that's not the way we're gonna go forward. Uh, so in parallel with this way of fabricating, we're looking into uh, large scale manufacturing of, of these devices. Uh, so uh, some sort of uh, embossing technologies, roll to roll manufacturing. Um, there's a lot of uh, technologies being developed and already being out there, for example, in the food uh, packaging industry. So um, I'm not really concerned about, about that part. Okay, great, thank you. And also, I like very much these micro containers with only, only directional capability to release the drug and looks really very, very interesting, very smart. But I was wondering, once you deliver these micro containers, uh, uh, how you get advantages of this unidirectional because they go in a, a random way. So are these directed or what happens? So um, you can direct, you can direct it somewhat. We have tried to coat them only on one side with a mucus adhesive coating, or you know, with uh, some fangs or shape that you kind of make them orient in one way and, and another in another. Um, I would say that if they have the size and shape that I showed for the regular issue eight containers, most of them actually land on the side. Okay. Whereas if you make them more flat, they're gonna be either up, I mean, it's like flipping a coin. And then you need to play more with the geometry um, if you want to orient itself correctly. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Andrea. Uh, in fact, uh, there was also a question for the uh, introductory talk and uh, Enrique already uh, gave the, the response. It was related to the stability of graphene oxide, uh, depending on the substrates where the graphene is patterned. So, and he gave uh, responses to this. Uh, so I think we have uh, time if, uh, for another question. If you want to do it directly, uh, probably Alex can open the microphone. So is the last uh, uh, probably question. If there is any from the, because I don't see any other question here. Alex, right? Oh yeah, we have a question by Bayram, Bayram Fazliu, who is uh, asking, what kind of compounds uh, did you synthesize? As far as I know, cellulose esters are used as drug deliver delivers. So this is the question he has. Yes, so, so as such, we're not synthesizing. Uh, we're kind of using materials that are more or less uh, already available. Um, so for the cellulose, uh, that's not something we're looking at right now, but I have a colleague who would like to, to move into this. So it is for sure something that's interesting. And I think primarily for colon deliver, it, delivery, it seems to be an interesting uh, material. Yeah, it comes another question. So. Uh, 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 micro drug carriers could be applicants for radiation therapy, uh, not only for imaging, but also for the remediation and radiation on tumors. Uh -huh. This is the I question. Mean, um, you mean as a marker or as a up concentrator, maybe? Both, probably. Yes, yes. I think that's a, that's a good idea. <laughs> good. Thanks. Thank you. So, I don't see, I don't see, let me, sorry. Yeah, people are just uh, uh, saying wonderful uh, presentation. So I cannot see more, more questions. So if not more questions, so unless Alex is uh, letting me know, yes, no more questions. So again, it was a wonderful talk, uh, Anja, and I thank you very much for sharing your knowledge and your expertise and all these uh, great, uh, nice stories you had, uh, you have in your lab and in, with your collaborators. And we really wish that uh, uh, this is a starting point of collaborations with ICN2 and also uh, Manchester and also other colleagues who are here, assistant and may be willing to contact you. So thank you again. And uh, wish the next time it will be in person in Barcelona. 
sunny Barcelona <laughs> and leave some days. Uh, well, you can come to Copenhagen. Uh, uh, yeah, of course. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, and thank you to everyone who was uh, assistant here in this talk. Uh, have everybody a very nice uh, evening. Thank you very much.